options on how to configure the socket. Earlier we have been using the socket as it is, right, without any manipulation. We take the default socket, whatever the default configuration or the values, and then we have been using it. Right? We connect the socket, we pass the, pass, uh, the data between the socket from between client and server. But now we're going to look at detail of the socket itself. Right? So these are some of the things which we might use uh, when the time comes. And it, it also gives us an idea of how the socket works. Right? So it's very important to understand this. So there are two functions in order for us to get the current socket uh, default options. So there's the get socket, op get socket option and the set socket option. Right? So obviously the get one is that we will try to get the current value of a particular socket configuration. Right? So we'll say, okay, uh, get a socket option of this one and show us what the value, current value is. And set is basically setting it. So when you want to get the, get the value or current option for a socket, we will indicate. So before we do this, we need to create a socket, obviously. So you must create a socket. The socket must be open. Then we can get the current configuration of it. So first is that we, we, the first parameter is the open socket. Next two is basically which level of the configuration we want to, want to go and then also which variable we want to look at. Right? We'll, we'll come to this later. And the third one is that basically a, a, a place or other variable where we want to hold the value. So the socket option will, will, will send us a return value. So the return value of the socket option will be stored inside this particular parameter which we pass into the function. And finally is the length of the socket. Uh, such stru structure. Right, so this is de described here. So next we're going to take a look at these two. And the second and third parameters, what is the level and what is the option name. So in your book, if you look at it, there's a long list of them. It's a bit small on the screen, but if you look at a book or on your screen, it's a bit, you can understand. So there are two levels, two information here. The first one is the level. Level is basically family, right? Which family of the socket option we, which you want to look at. So whether you want to look at the basic socket functions or we want to look at IP protocol or we want to look at IP protocol for IPv6 or the other one is IPv6 or IPv4 or IPv6. So there are a few families or groups of protocols which we can look at. Right? So we specify we want to this level. All right. Once we specify the basic socket uh, level, then you identify which option or which parameter we want to opt in the value. Right? So there's so many of them. We want to look at whether the, the broadcast value, the debug value, whether the debug uh, option is set or not, don't route, error, keep alive, and all these things. So there are quite a long list of them. So in this particular chap chapter, we're going to take a look at some of these socket options, the common ones, and then we're going to describe one by one what they actually do. Right? So when we, we, we call the when we call the get socket option, the second and third parameters basically comes from this this uh, from the this table, right? So level we indicate this this value, which one it is, and then the name is basically one of this. Right, we'll take a look at an example of how to call them later on. And there's furthermore, there's, so this is transport layer socket options. Again, same thing, there's a level here and then the op name. And there's some description. It tells you what you're supposed to do what is, and what is the value return and so on, whether it can be used for get and set and all these things. All right, so let's say, so there's, there's a, there is a, a program given to you which we can run later to check the current socket options. All right, so this is the one given in the book. So the, the, what are the current default values? Right, so later we will try and run that. So let me just show you what, what we have on this machine. Right, this is what it is. So once you run this particular program, you'll get this list. So what it does, this program does, it will go and individually check, get the, 
it will run get sock opt for each one of these values and then display the return value on the screen. So what it says that, so these are the, 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 these are the socket options and the default values which are currently in the machine. All right. we'll, we'll go through one by one and what, what it means. All right, so let's get straight into it. So we go to one by one, some of the socket options uh, which we are, uh, the, the common ones. Right? So first one is the broadcast. So the SO basically refers to socket options. Right. So broadcast. So broadcast basically, if you set this particular option, that means you allow broadcast messages to be sent out from the socket. Normally, the socket does not broadcast. Right? You only send the data to the, the other side. You only send to the, uh, to the server or to the peer. It does not send to both sides. So if you want to send a broadcast, mo broadcast uh, mode, then we can set it to on. Right? So if you look, the current default value is normally off. So the default value for broadcast is normally off. We don't broadcast socket activity to other users or to other machines. Now it's between the server and the client only. The second one is the debug. So debug is basically, again, debug, you know, the, the debugging mode. That means it will show all the small, small details happening on the socket. When you open the socket, it will tell you whether it's, when you, when you, it, it will try to say it's communicating with the, it's sending SYN packets from the client to the server and the server reply, how long it takes. And everything will be, small, small details will be listed out, listed out on the screen right, to show what actually is happening, right? So in normal mode, again, we put the, de the debug mode off because we do not want to be interrupted by all these small, small messages coming in. Right, we just say, you want to connect, and once you successful, just let us know. If some, for some reason you want to trace, where's the problem? Then you set the debug, the debug mode on, and you can check one by one what are the messages coming in, whether the SYN packet is sent, how big is the SYN packet, how long does it take for the SYN packet to reach the other side, and whether the server is replying with the SYN, and so on. So all these things, details will be given to you, and you can trace where the problem is. Right. Right, so normally, again, debug mode is off. Otherwise, your screen will be, too, will be cluttered with too much information there. And TCP only works, uh, sorry, the debug mode only works with the TCP uh, sockets, not the UDP. Right? Another one is don't route. Don't route basically says that don't use routing tables. That means when a socket, when a, when a, sorry, a packet comes into a machine to the, to the server, Normally, the packet will go through a routing table, right? You will run the routing algorithm. So then, it will, it will uh, be, be sent out to a particular interface. So if we set this particular option off, on, then we, we say we, are, we want to bypass the routing table. We say, if this packet comes in, send it to, di to this person or to this machine. Don't use a routing, routing table. Again, by default, it's normally off, right? We do, unless for specific reason, we want to do that. So force a packet to be sent out to a particular interface. And the uh, error option is basically to get the current error which happened on a, on a socket. So when an error happened on a socket, you can actually obtain what is the error which has been just occurred on the socket. So there's a variable there. Which we, so this particular option basically stores the, the error. And then once the error has been fetched, the value will reset to zero, right? So the error is normally, if you look at the default, its error is normally zero. That means currently there's no error. So if the error, have, if the error happens, then this value will change to some, to some number corresponding with the type of error. So once you fetch the error, then the, the, the value will revert back to zero to say that it has been cleared. The error has been already uh, detected. Another useful socket option uh, function will be the keep alive. Now, we have seen last time also that when the client and the server interact with one another, right, there is, there is, we send messages between them. 
Right? So let's say we have a client and a server. Right? So the client, the server has a listening port, and then it has a connector port. Connector socket, then the client has a, also a connector socket. Right? Then if there's another client, of course, it is also another socket. Right? So we saw this in the client server version, if you use the multiplexing. Right? Now the thing is that once the client is connected to the server, this particular socket is open. This communication is open. Right? And this socket will remain open until either the server terminates it, closes it, or the client closes the connection. So this socket is always open for traffic. So we can send data as when we like. But what happens if the client or server does not send any data on it? Open the, open the socket, after that, send one or two messages, don't do anything else, right? So the thing is, will the, will the system, will the TCP layer continuously keep, keep alive, or keep the socket open until infinitely? Or will it close after some time? And because if it keeps you open and nobody using it, then it's, it's, it's wasting resources, All right? So this is what the keep alive is supposed to do. It means that what it tries to do is that if there's no activity between the so connected sockets for some time, then one side of the socket will try to check and see whether the other side is alive. Right? So it will, it will send a keep alive packet, a probe, to say that, are you alive? And the other side will respond, yes or no. If you say yes, okay, then you keep it open. Right? And after some time, no activity again, then it will send a, a keep alive. So the keep alive is basically to maintain connection with a peer when no data is exchanged. Right? So it will send, say, keep alive probes are sent if there's no activity for two hours. Right? So that means we open the socket, after send some messages, then we keep quiet. The client server both keep quiet on this particular socket for two hours, nothing happened. But the socket is not closed. So for two hours, nothing happens, then the TCP will take over. It will try to see whether the other side is still alive. So it will send a special packet called keep alive, and the other side will respond, okay, I'm still alive, but nothing to send yet. Right? It's just like the, the, the MH370 missing. So we can use the same example, right? So we send, no, the, the plane is supposed to always correspond with the air traffic control, right? So he says, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. It, so the, the communication is open, so the socket is open. So if you don't hear from the pilot, not two hours, la, let's say 10 minutes, you don't hear from the pilot 10 minutes, after every 10 minutes, then you get suspicious. Then you call, you call the plane. Pilot asks you to ask the pilot to, re to report your current position and altitude or speed or whatever it is. Again, if the pilot responds, okay, fine. Then we keep quiet. After another 10 minutes or one hour, we try again. Normally the pilot should do it. If he doesn't do it, then the air traffic controller will, will actually call, right? So this is the keep alive to make sure that the other side is still alive. Right? So that's what, what you're supposed to do. Of course, you, you know what happened at the MA370, there's no keep alive. Send nothing, nothing came back, right? Except the phone ring, phones are ringing, so that would be different. Right, so, so this basically, so it's basically to maintain the, the connection between the two uh, sides. So there are two, three scenarios. So let's say after two hours, nothing happens, Let's say after two hours, no activity, so one side will send a keep alive, right? So when it, what, it sends a keep alive, what happens? So there are two scenarios. The peer responds with acknowledgement. So you send a keep alive, the other side re responds, acknowledge. So everything's okay. And that means the other side is active, it's still alive. Okay, so that's fine. But if the peer responds with reset, so I send a keep alive, right? But nothing happens. So that means, reset means that it does not recognize your socket anymore. Right? So it sends, 
a reset. So that means the peer probably has crashed and rebooted and does not recognize the socket ID anymore. So therefore, it was, so the, the, the TCP will report an error saying that connection has been reset and then it will close the socket. Or, worst case, no response. You send a keep alive, nothing. Send a keep alive, nothing. So again, the TCP, although it's very patient, but it, it is also has limits. So you will try about seven, eight times, right? So the, the, the rules in the TCP says that you will try eight times, eight probes. You send, send, uh, send a keep alive probe a packet, no, mess, no, no response, wait for 75 seconds, send another one. No response, wait for another 75 seconds, send another one. You try eight times, so TCP will try eight times. Nothing happens, then you will give up. It's a timeout, and because, because you cannot wait forever, right? So there are three scenarios, right? So normally the keep alive is basically to, to make sure that the other side is still, the machine is still running. Right? If there's no activity, if there's activity, then no problem. Because then we are always refreshing the socket. We know that something is happening. Right, so this is basically a summary of how do we detect. Right, I put this picture up. I don't know whether how many of you, how many of you know this? The keep alive, right? staying alive or rather. There used to be a, how many of you know this? No, top Okay, you should go and listen to this, this particular album. It's from 1976 or 77 or something like that. Very old. You should go and listen. It's a, it's a, it's a song, right? Staying alive. Anyway, so, so, so this basically, t t this table summarizes of what we happens when you send, uh, when, the, when uh, there's no uh, connection or no, no response from the other side. Right? So if the TCP activity is running, sending data, then no problem. Right? So if, the, if this we've seen earlier, if it crashes, then it will send a pin. If, it's, if, if, it, uh, if the uh, host crashes, it, it will reset and so on. Right? The thing is that, what we look at is here. Uh, if the connection is idle, then keep alive is sent. Right? So then, if the process crashes, it, it will try to close the connection. If the, if the host crashes, then you'll be timeout, right? And if, if the host is unreachable, then of course it's unreachable. So if the keep alive is off, then we're not, we're not able to track anything, right? So normally if you see that our, our default option is that keep alive is normally default is off, right? We don't do it. So if we, if we set our socket to say, when you open the socket, make it uh, keep alive to be on. And then the system will check once in a while to make it always open. Otherwise, if, you, if it's off, then if no activity for two hours, the system automatically will close the connection, close the socket connection. All right, that's another one, right? So keep alive is basically to keep the connection alive between the server and client. That's another one, so-called linger, right? Linger is related to close, when you close the socket. So the idea is that when you close a socket, do you terminate everything straight away or you wait for a while? Right? Just let's say, when you say, okay, a class over, what happens? Everybody just rush out? Or you hang around a little bit, you talk a bit, chat a bit, and all these things. Right? I pack up things. That's, so that's a linger. How long do you linger around? How long do you hang around? And what do you do, actually? That's what it's supposed to do. Right? So the linger basically changes the way the socket behaves when close is called. So by default, it closes immediately. That means when I say close, whatever data in the outstanding I will just terminate, right? I'm oh, sorry, whatever data in the, in the socket send buffer, I will try to send it. But if data is in the reading buffer coming in, I will just stop, I will not read anymore, right? Because I say I want to stop immediately. So by default, it returns immediately. But then there are, so we can set this particular linger uh, option and then we can control how it works. 
Right? So there are three scenarios. One is that the lingering is off. So that is the, we use this particular variable, L on or off. So lingering on or off, if zero means off. Right? So it's off. So in that case, we return immediately, no problem, as usual. Close means close. Right? That, or the lingering could be uh, the, 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 the variable is now non-zero, that means lingering is on, but our lingering time is basically zero. Then we say, okay, when we close, you can linger around, but you linger around for zero seconds. It's something similar, right, except there's a slight difference here. So here, the thing is that it will, connection will be aborted whenever uh, the close command is uh, given. Right? So it discards any data in the send buffer. So if you say lingering is zero seconds, no hanging around, whatever data in the send or receive buffer or socket will, will be ignored. I don't want to receive anything. Even halfway sending, I say to close, and then with the lingering off, or lingering on with zero seconds, then it will just terminate there and then. It will not even completely send the data out. Right? Just cut off straight away there. And the third one is that, all right, lingering is on, but now we, we specify a particular time, say two seconds or three seconds. So this means that after the close is executed, we say close command for the connection, the system will not, the TCP will not close the connection for another two or three seconds, depending on how much value we put it here. Right? So this will give time for the, your data, which is in the send buffer, to be sent, make sure it is received properly on the other side, and you receive acknowledgement from the other side, within the time frame. Right? So within two or three seconds, you can show that ensure that whatever data you're sending will be properly received by the other side and you can receive acknowledgement. Right? So the kernel will linger when the socket is closed. If there's remaining data to be sent, process will sleep until either the data is sent and acknowledgement received or the time expires. Right? The lingering time expires and you did not receive acknowledgement, okay, fine, then we close. Right? So there's a, there's a data structure here we use. The first one is basically whether it's on or off, and second one is basically the time. How much time do you want to give for the lingering of the socket after we issue a uh, close command? Right. So this is to basically explain the scenario of, of what's happening. So here, we issuing, we, we, we send a write of the, uh, we do a write uh, function on the socket, so it sends the data, but the data is not immediately used or immediately recognized, so it does not send acknowledgement for that, it's queued, then we do a close command, close functions, close means you will send a fin, right, and then if it's default, if you're using no lingering, then the close will immediately return, so I close straight away, that means I'm not going to send or receive data anymore. So, when the server, we send a fin command, a fin packet, it, it will reply back, right? but you're not reading anymore. So even when the data is acknowledged, acknowledgement of data comes, you already close your socket. So in other words, you do not know whether the data you sent earlier here has been received by the application on the other side. We do not know, because we close very fast, immediately. So here, so what do we do? How do you overcome this? We can use the lingering option then, right? So we, we close the socket, but the, with the lingering has a small positive value, right? So now the socket will not close immediately, but you will wait for a certain amount of time. Then we will close depending on the time. Right? So in this case, there's enough time for the for the data which you sent earlier to be acknowledged. So the acknowledgement, enough time for it to come back before the timer actually expires. So in that case, we will know that the data sent earlier has been received correctly. However, if our lingering time is very small, very short, I right, say you linger only 0.1 second or 0.2 second, then it's not much use, right? Because you send a date, you send the close, and then immediately you wait only very short time, 0.1 second or 0.2 seconds, it closes already. 
So when acknowledgement comes, again, it's too late. We don't wait for it. We, we don't wait too. We don't wait enough. We don't wait for it long enough to receive the acknowledgement. Right? So the lingering value, if you want to do, it has to be a, a proper time. Right? That's what it is showing here. Or the other option, we don't use close. Right? As we said earlier, we have another option. Don't use close. We just use shut down. So shut down means we will shut down the socket stage by stage. We say, OK, we're shutting down my side for reading or writing, but I can receive, still receive packets coming in from you. All right? So shutdown is better, in that sense. So if in, the, in that case, so we do, we do a shutdown. Right? We send a data. Data is not acknowledged yet. But now we, we, shut, we do a shutdown on the, we say we are not going to, uh, we're not going to send any more data to you. Right? But I can still receive data. So shutdown is sends a fin command. So when the acknowledgement comes for the data, we can still receive it and acknowledge it yeah. and recognize it because you can still receive data, but you're not sending out. Right? Okay. So shutdown has no lingering. Only close has a lingering. Right? So close command has a lingering option because it, it tries to close immediately. Right? Shutdown is normally partial. Right? So, so compared with the shutdown to close, it's always safer to use shutdown. Right? So when you use a close, then you have to know what is it all about. Uh, or you can set the lingering option to make sure that you can wait for a certain amount of time so that data will be acknowledged properly. Another option, what we can do is that we use our own mm -hmm. Acknowledgement. Right? Earlier, the acknowledgement we are receiving is basically from the from the TCP, right? The data we send from the client to the server. When data arrives, it, it will queue up on the TCP layer. It will not be given to the application layer yet. How long it takes, we won't know. It depends on how busy the server is, right? So only we. we what we want to know is when the, if the data has been received by the application on the server itself. So what we can do is write, we can write a simple application level acknowledgement. Right? So that, we, that means on the server side, we'll say once you receive data, it will send an acknowledgement packet back to the client right? at the application layer on top of the one sending by the TCP layer. Right? So to know if peer has sent data. So what we do is simple. Right? So this on the client side. So once the client send the data on the socket, right here, once the client send data to the socket, what it will do, it will read, it will wait for acknowledgement to come back from the server. So this acknowledgement is only one byte. Right? After sending data, we wait for acknowledgement from the server, which is only one byte. We read for it. Wait for it. On the server side, the server will read from the socket the actual data itself, once the data has been read properly, then it will send, maybe in this case, just send one byte, which could be an empty string. Just send, send something blank, one byte, because the client is waiting for one byte. So just send something, just send something, send something back, as long as the other side is waiting. So now we know that the server has actually received the server application has actually received the data which was sent by the client. Right? So, so we send the data. Right? The TCP, once it receives the data, it will acknowledge the data back to the TCP layer. But the, t the data is still in the TCP layer. It's not given to the application yet. So once the application reads it, then it will write a one byte acknowledgement back here. So this is one we are waiting for. This one we, do, we don't care much. We, we, we wait for this then. Right? So once we receive this, then it will be close. Right? So we call this the acknowledgement level, acknowledgement layer acknowledgement. Appli sorry, application layer acknowledgement. So it guarantees that data, guarantees that when the grid in client returns, the server has already read the data sent to it. Right? Earlier we've been doing that, we don't use this. We just write to the socket. And then we read the reply from the socket. 
Right? The reply was echo. But we do not know whether the, our earlier part has been read or not. We do not know. Right? So in this case, we can actually do that. Okay. So this table basically summarizes the lingering options. Right? So lingering options only works for close, close function. Right? Whether when the lingering is off or lingering is on and, uh, and, the, and uh, the value is zero, lingering time is zero, or lingering is on but the lingering time is more than zero. Right? Then it, the, the conditions will change accordingly. For shutdown, it's a separate matter whether we shut down for reading or shut down for writing. That's a different matter. Okay, so we'll already talk, talk about these things. Now, another other useful socket options. So that was basically in terms of closing the, uh, checking whether the connection was alive, socket, socket, socket connection was alive by you keeping the keep alive, or to see how fast the socket closes. That's lingering. Now, the other thing is good to know also the buffers involved. So remember when we create a socket, there will be a buffers related to it, right? So here, in the client side, there will be two buffers. The send buffer and the receive buffer, right? Again, on the server side, there will be two buffers too. For each socket connection. So for each socket connection, for each socket, there will be two buffers allocated. So when the data comes in our socket, it will be go into the receive buffer. When the client wants to send data, it will go into the, your, your data will be put into the send buffer of the socket, then it will be sent out. All right? So the thing is that, what is the size of these two buffers? And can, whether we can change it. That's how it works. All right, so we can actually change the default size of the socket receive buffers. So if you look at our default values, The socket receive buffer and the socket send buffer, these are current default values in bytes. Right? So 131,000, that's quite a lot. About 131 kilobytes of buffer size, right? send and receive. Right? So these buffers are also used to make sure there's no overflow. Right? So the buffer size will indicate when the packets are coming in from the server, the receive buffer of the client must be able to accommodate all data coming in onto in, into this. If it goes too much over that, then it will overflow. Then some of the data might be lost. So we do not want this to happen. So normally the TCP will take care. You know, remember TCP has a flow control, right? So it will make sure that the buffer does not overflow. And there is there is some rule saying that buffers should be at least four times the connections MSS, the maximum segment size. If you remember the MSS is basically how much data is sent in each packet by the TCP. So MSS is basically somewhere in between here. When we send data between the client and server, we send data in, in small packets. How big the packet is basically this MSS size, which is determined by the TCP layer. So we say so the so the rule says that the the, the the server, the, the sending and the receiving buffers should be at least four times this size. So four MSS, four packets coming in can accommodate into the receive buffer. Enough capacity to, to receive four times before you read them. Right? The second one is, we call them the socket receive low water mark or the soccer, uh, sorry, the socket sending socket send buffer low watermark, right? What the low watermark basically means that how much minimum data that should be in the receive packet, in the receive buffer before you can read data from it. What is the minimum amount, what is the minimum amount of data must be received in the bu receive buffer before you can actually read it, right? So normally by default is one byte. As long as there's one byte of data in the receive buffer, you can read it. Right? Minimum is one. Then for the for the sent low watermark, this one, it basically says that how much empty space 
must be there before you can send data to the packet, to, to the socket. Right? So how much empty space, how much minimum empty space there must be in the send buffer before you can write data to the socket. So that's the minimum amount. So these two are minimum amount. So, so the, for TCP, the default is about 2048. So before you can send data, the system will check whether you have enough 2048 bytes of empty space in your send buffer. If not, it will just hold on, you see, not, not enough empty space to send. So this is basically to make sure that there's the, when you send data, there is space in the send buffer. Right? The other ones, like reusing address or reusing port. If you remember last time when we tried to run the client and server uh, samples, applications, if you close the server and then you try to run the server immediately, it will say bind error. Right? That means basically the port was being used, it was not been released by the OS yet. And we, are, we want to run again by using the same port. Right? So there is a way out. So we can say we want to reuse the port again for something else. Same port number. Right? So what it basically says is that if you want to reuse the same IP address or the same port number for different applications, then we can set these two options in the socket. So by, by default, they are normally off. Right? Because we do not want to make, mess around with those things. So normally is that reuse address, reuse port is normally both off for safety reasons. But if you, if you know what you are doing, then we can actually enable them whenever it's required. Right? So this example gives us the scenarios when we want to, when we, we might want to use them to reuse the address or reuse the port. Right, so here I basically say to allow, so one option is to, to allow a listening port, a listening server to start and bind its well-known port, even if previously established connection was used in port, right? So we started a previous server, listening port on, 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 a, on, on, a, on a particular uh, number, and then we want to restart again using the same port number, and the previous one has not been released yet, right? Okay, so this, one, we, this example we have seen, we normally encounter. Or to allow a new server started on the same port as, ex as existing server, but with different IP address, right? So this could be normally when we have multiple, when we have multiple hosting services. One machine has running multiple servers, multiple web servers, same machine has multiple IP addresses. For UDP servers, right, again to bind the same port to multiple sockets with different IP addresses. Or to allow complete duplicate bound binding, bind the same local IP address and the same port address to different sockets. So normally in UDP you can do, you can do these kind of things. Right? So basically it, 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 this option allows us to you reuse the same port or IP, IP address when required. Right? But for normal purposes we don't, do, we don't do that. It's better not to do that. Otherwise, your, your client-server communication get, might get mixed up. Right, so those are generic, common socket options. Now we take a look at a specific IP socket options which are related to IPv4 only. Right? Later we'll see IPv6. So there's, there's one also which, which allows us, the socket option allows us to build our own IP header. Remember when we send data over the, over the network, as the data goes through the different layers, each layer will put a, a header to it. TCP layer will put a header, IP layer will put a header, then the physical layer will put a data link layer will put a header. So if we want to create our own IP header, then we can use this function. Right? Again, normally we don't do it for ordinary reasons. But if you're running some diagnostic programs right, to check the hop from one machine to another machine, then you might want to put this, create your own header so that it's this header can be modified with the values as it goes from one hop to another hop. So the common example is a trace route, right? I'll show you what trace route is. Trace route is basically to, to detect the path taken from source to destination, right? What are the hops taken from, from source to destination by intermediate routers? 
Right? So stress start is normally quite very useful if you want to troubleshoot the problems between your machine and the uh, server. You cannot reach the server, you want to find out which part of the network is not responding. So we do that and see where it stops. Right? Another one is basically uh, type of service, TOS. Again, this is also, also in the IP header. Again, we can set a socket, say, okay, uh, this socket will be used for this particular type of traffic and we want to, we want to uh, set, uh, set the type of traffic to it so that you can give priority to it. Right? So you, can, you can set high priority, low delay, high throughput and all that. So all these things again can be IP layer, IPv4 layer options can be set in the TOS here. Right? So there's a whole list of them. Uh, if you look at the diagram, there's a whole list. There are about seven, eight parameters you can do. Again, we don't do, normally we don't do this. Right, but if you're building a, a particular client server application, you want to take advantage of this. You can say, this, my traffic should be given high priority. Right, then you can use this. The other one is that TTL, right, time to leave. Time to leave is basically to say that how long the packet will be alive in the network. How many times it will be forwarded before it, will, it is discarded. Right? So it indicates how long the data, how long data can exist. So normally it's counted in hops, right? So each time the packet goes to a router, the TTL value, value will be decremented by one, right? So once the value reaches zero, then it will be dropped, right? So again, the default value, I think is about, the default values for TTL is, where is it? 64, right? So that means each time you send a packet, IP packet from your socket, it, it can go a maximum of 64 hops. So if your server is more than 64 hops away, it will not reach. Right? This time you saw the trace route, isn't it? Right? We saw the one going to Yahoo. This one is basically the hops. Right? How many hops? 1, 18, 19, 20, and so on. So if, if our Yahoo is, so if this thing reaches 64 and still not reach Yahoo, then it will stop. Because it's, it's beyond, it's already dead by now. Right. So again, we can use this to, to troubleshoot and to find out how far away a particular uh, server is. Again, normally we don't do it, right? We just leave the default value. But notice that this particular Socket options are, are dealing with IP layer options, right? We're going to IP, we're modifying the IP layer parameters, right? The header, the TOS, and the TTL. The same way we can also modify some IPv6 parameters too, right? So the, the common ones are basically don't fragment. So it basically says that we will say that when, uh, when uh, packets come to IPv6 uh, socket, don't fragment it, don't, don't break it up, right? Pass it on. If it's too big, just, just ignore. Right? Normally, what happens is that the packet is too large and your MSS, your packet says 1,000 bytes, your MSS is 512. That means the packet has been broken up into multiple chunks, multiple blocks before you can send out. So if you don't fragment it on, then you don't, you're not going to break up. You're not going to waste time on it, right? right? So again, we can set this thing. Don't fragment. The other one is the unicast hops. This is similar to, to uh, IPv4 TTL. Again, say how many hops you can go. And another one will be, say, IPv6 only. So that means we, if we create a socket and we only want to use for IPv6 traffic, then we can set this particular option on the socket and say we force the socket to communicate only using IPv6 packets and not anything else. Right, if, you want to do, if you want to do that. Okay. Now others, now this one, so that was IP layer. Now we're talking about TCP layer socket options. Right. Earlier we said that MSS, right? The, the send and receive buffer must be four times, at least four times the size of MSS to be able to receive four packets into the receive buffer, right? 
The thing is that we can also change the MSS value if you want to. I think otherwise take a default value or we can change the we can change the the, the MSS value. So, so the maximum amount of data that will be sent to the peer based on the information given by the SIM packet. So normally when the handshaking occurs, when you when you make a uh, socket connection, uh, you connect the socket, you will send handshaking between the client and server. That's when they will they will decide what is the size of MSS. How much data I, can, I want to send you, how much you are willing to receive. Right? So once the socket is established, the value of MSS cannot be increased. They have to continue using the same MSS value. But it can, it can reduce. It will reduce if there's too much traffic. Congestion, okay, then we reduce the amount, amount of data we send. But we cannot increase it the more than the agreed value because the other side will not be ready for it. Right? So again, generally, we don't try to change this max value. MSS value because it, it, it will interfere and all that. But the options allow us to do that. So the default value for MSS, I think, let's see what's the default value. MSS is 512 here, right? So 512 bytes we send at one time, right? But our, our, our buffers are so much, right? So we can receive lots of packets by the network. We can store it in the buffer before we can actually read it. Right, so it gives us a safety margin. Right, so the last socket option is basically a special one. So we call it, we call it a, no, a no delay. Again, the way the TCP communicates between a client and server, it uses some kind of algorithms, the Nagel's algorithm. Right. So this particular option allows us to disable the algorithm. Right. So what it does is that we want to reduce the number of small packets on the network. So it's basically this, is that once we start sending data on the network, for example, we want to send six characters. We want to say hello, H-E-L-L-O and apostrophe mark. Right? We want to send the six characters. We send them very, very fast. Send H, send E, and all that. We don't wait for acknowledgement to come. We just send them first, all together. Right? So what happens is that at any one time, there are more than two or three, maybe two or three are outstanding at each time. They are the character packets have been sent, but they are not acknowledged yet. So it's not a good idea. We have sent too many, but they're not acknowledged. And we, later it will be difficult to trace which has been acknowledged, which has been received correctly, or which has not. So it's better to send a few, and then wait for acknowledgement before sending new ones. Right? That's the idea. That's what the Nagel's algorithm will do. Right? So in this case, it will send, so the first time it will send one packet, or one character, and then wait for acknowledgement. Once you get acknowledgement, then send a few. Okay, send, okay, send next two letters, E and L. Once you get these two, acknowledgement for that, then send the next two. So at any one time, there are only two outstanding, two packets are outstanding, which are not been acknowledged yet. Right? So in this case, if you lose, you only lose two packets. And if you need to transmit, you need to retransmit two packets. Right? Not too much. Right. So this is what the Nagel's algorithm will do. Right? But so this is what the Nagel's algorithm will do. Right? So but, but however, if you want to disable this, we can do that. Right? If, you want, if you try to be smart and say, okay, I know what I'm doing. I don't want to follow this rule. I want to send lots of multiple packets. Okay, I will do that. So small packets are, so what is the definition of a small packet? Any packet which is smaller than the MSS size, right? So basically the idea is to prevent connection from having multiple small packets outstanding at any, at any time. Right? So you want to send, if you have small packet to send, make, don't send them too many. Send a few, wait for acknowledgement, then send again. Right? That's what the, the Nagel's algorithm will actually enforce. We'll make sure you will do that. Um, so this is a program to check your socket options. Again, it's a bit complicated. So you don't have to understand how, how it works, right? In fact, it, it could be written in a sim simpler way, but they, routine, they make it, try to make it generic and general, so they make it complicated. So it doesn't matter, right? You don't have to know how, you, how it works. Just 
understand this, the, that you can produce, you can, you can obtain the socket options from the system and then can display it. Right? So what you need to know is basically that these this functions you use, that line number 84, right? Get socket option. So get socket option, open the socket, and then we say what is the level, and then what is the name. Remember that from the table you, you can put it, you can write your own program. Just call this multiple times, and then give a, a variable uh, name and the length. That's it. You should be able to get the result back, right? So if you do a simple program, then you can write call these functions multiple times. So here to try to do in a loop, and then the sockets which we want to, want to call, they put it into an array, right? So the family type is called here. The type is uh, the family uh, level. Level is here, the family, and then each, each one of them is given here. And then they declare other things, right? To, to be able to call multiple times in loop. Again, this is another useful function. Again, if you want to change the parameters of the socket again. Earlier, we're looking at the different options, right? So now, if you want to control the socket in terms of blocking or non-blocking, right? Earlier, we previously we, we saw that normally each socket option, each socket when you connect, if you open, it's normally blocking, right? Each action on it is blocking. That means you, once you run it, it will wait until it's completed before it returns to you. Right? For example, like read and write. When you read, a, when you want to read from a socket, to wait until there is data coming in, then it will inform you, right? So in the meantime, you cannot do anything. But if you want to change it to say the socket, you will make it in non-blocking mode. Right? Then we use this F control function, right? Or we want to make the socket into signal driven, right? Signal driven means you want to set that then. The TCP will inform us when data is already arrived on the socket as we copy it into our buffer and say, okay, now it's ready. Right? So we don't have to, and we can do something else in the meantime. Right? So if you want to set our socket to this particular type, then we use this function. Right? So what we do is we'll call this F control and then we will, the, the, we will use this particular function, uh, f set l, uh, f set flag, the flag we will set to non-block, right? We make it non-blocking or we set the flag to asynchronization. And then it will generate the signal when the socket is, is ready. We can also use it to get the current owner of a socket, right? Get own or set the owner of a socket. Right? So get own is basically who owns the socket, which process. It will give you some ID. Right, so you create a socket, I want to know which process ID created this particular socket. Who is the owner? So we can use this function. Or we want to set the owner to some other process. Right? We create a socket, we want to say this socket belongs to another process. Okay, we can do that also. Normally we don't do, we do, we don't do this kind of advanced thing because it, it, it messes up things. Right, so this is basically an example. So to fetch, to fetch the flags for a socket, we use f get f get fl to set the flags. We use f set fl, right? And the flags are basically two types of flags described here: the non-blocking mode and the synchronous mode, right? which we can set or we, which, which which we can uh, obtain. So this is the code given, right? So to set the flags, to make a socket non-blocking, we create a socket first. Then we will use this particular line, right? This particular code to make it non-blocking. So the thing is that before we make it non-blocking, we need to we need to read the current flex first. Right? So we op, we extract out the current flex. What we say is we read the current settings first, and then the current settings are all right. All it with a new flag, and then store it. So what we do is that we will use F control to get the current flex, F get FL, get the current flex and put it into here. Right? So now we get a current flex. Now this flex, we we orate operation all, logical all, with a with our flag, non-block. So now our flag has been changed to this 
then we set the flex with a new value. So we use F control again now to set it, and our new flex has been changed. All right, so we, we take out our previous values, current values, we modify them, and then put the flex back into the socket. All right, that's how we, we do it. That's how to set. To clear the flex, to make it all uh, back to or initialize it. So again, what we need to do is we will read the current settings again. We get the current flex. And now we will do a, a logical end operation with the with the inverse of the value which we want to do. Right. So if you want to say we. We do not, earlier we set it to non-blocking mode. Now we say we do not want non-blocking, we want to reverse it. Set back to initialize. So we say the, get the flex again. Now we or it, we, now we end it with the opposite of the inverse of the non-block. Right? And then again set the flex again. Again, not, most of the time we don't do this. Right? So we don't, we don't worry too much about the, the details. The main thing is that the flex of the socket can be set, right? Making whether non-blocking mode or asynchronous mode. So this table basically summarizes uh, what we use. So if you want to set the socket for non-blocking mode, we use F control function, and with the F set flag parameter and the non-blocking mode flag, right? If you want to set it for for signal driven, then the same thing we use for, then we use the is, is sync flag there. In the set owner, we use this. The get owner, we use this. Right? The rest, I think, doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay? All right. Now you can try this one and see what the values are. Right? 